Good morning. morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. Uh, Thank you, Pastor Robbie, for, you know, you always get a little nervous with introductions because they say all the glowing things about you, and then you say, well, I wish my wife were here to make some corrective (laughs) words. (laughs) words. <laughs> but um, it is a pleasure to have been with you all this weekend and to have the opportunity to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, as it appears in your bulletin, our passage for this morning comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40 and verses 27 through 31. And I want to speak with you this morning on this subject Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Walk together, children, don't you get weary. Let's hear what God says in his word. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, we thank you this morning for your word that is not dead, but that is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword that pierces to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning, judging the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The truth of the matter is, Lord, that we are all this morning in this place, naked and exposed to you, the one before whom we stand. And this is good news, Lord, because you, this means that you know, therefore, precisely what we stand in need of. So would you be pleased to take uh, these efforts of mine, weak and unworthy though they may be, and use them to meet us where we are and give us what we need. Speak your truth. Meet us and give us encouragement if we need it. Correction if we need it, hope if we need it, faith, that we would be people who live for the glory and fame of Jesus Christ, and we ask it in his name. Amen, amen, and amen. I want to share with you a little bit about a man named James Weldon Johnson. He is most popularly or commonly known the man who penned the words to the song that became known as the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. But in 1925, he and his brother, J. Rosamond Johnson, they compiled a two-volume hymnal titled The Books of the American Negro Spirituals. And in his introduction to that hymnal, Uh, Johnson wrote an original poem he titled, O Black and Unknown Bards, and this poem was a tribute to the unknown composers of the Negro spirituals. And in the first stanza of that poem, he writes this, O Black and Unknown Bards of Long Ago, how came your lips to touch the sacred fire? How in your darkness did you come to know the beauty and power of the minstrel's lyre? Who first from midst of his bonds lifted his eyes? Who first out of the still watch lone and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark kept soul burst into song? 
In the poem, he asks the question, how? The question is not how could they sing any song. It was no surprise that the music and the rhythm of, of the songs of the Negro spirituals were an integral part of the black experience in America. It was surely a connection between their rhythms and those found on the African continent. And it's no surprise that people from every background can make good sounding, toe tapping, rhythmic music. But the question is, how could they sing the spirituals? The music that James Wilson Johnson is referring to is redeemed music. How is it possible, he's asking, that out of such darkness sprang such beauty? For most African slaves in America, there was no triumph in this world. How could there be any songs of victory? In his tribute, Johnson says that the singer's spirit must have nightly floated free, though still about his hands he felt chains. How could they sing, he asked, better than they knew? One of those songs that I believe arises out of scripture passages, like the one before us in Isaiah chapter 40, is the song, Walk Together Children, Don't You Get Weary, the lyrics Go something like this, walk together children, don't you get weary, walk together children, don't you get weary, walk together children, don't you get weary, there's a great camp meeting in the promised land, sing together children, don't you get weary, sing together children, don't you get weary, sing together children, don't you get weary, there's a great camp meeting in the promised land, I'm going to sing and never tire, sing and never tire, shout and never tire. I'm going to mourn and never tire. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. And this is a community song. And although they did strive for freedom from bondage, the clarion call was that they were to walk together and sing together and shout together and all the while not grow weary. Even though they had to mourn, they encouraged each other to not grow weary even in their mourning. This is because they looked to the hereafter and understood that there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. The song is a collective call to hope in the middle of suffering, to joy in the middle of sorrow, to the strength to endure through the struggle. And this is the same call that we actually find the Lord giving his people in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 through 31. I want to talk about three things this morning. I want to talk about the complaint, the confession, and the comfort. The complaint, the confession, and the comfort. First, the complaint. Isaiah chapter 40 is a very popular chapter in the Bible. The New Testament quotes from Isaiah 40 several times. It's quoted, verse 3 of Isaiah 40 is quoted in the gospel accounts with reference to John the Baptist when he announces the coming of the Lord Jesus. Verse 3 of Isaiah 40 says, A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verses 6 and 8 of this chapter are quoted by the apostle Peter as he writes to suffering Christians in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 24 to 25 where Peter quotes to saying all flesh is like grass and all is glory like the flower of grass the grass withers and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever and Peter says and this word is the good news that was preached to you the apostle Paul quotes from verse 13 uh, of Isaiah 40 in Romans 11:34 when he asks for who who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Indeed, this chapter is a turning point in the entire book of Isaiah. The theme of God's judgment is the prevailing theme in the first 39 chapters of the book. And the turning point comes in verse 1 of chapter 40 with these words, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. 
And the word of comfort is necessary because of the people's condition. Their rebellion and their unbelief has resulted in judgment and they issue a complaint to God. Their complaint is that the Lord doesn't see them, nor does he care about them. We find out about their complaint through the Lord's question in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and why do you speak this way, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and from my God my right or my justice is overlooked. This is a collective my. This is the people of Israel as a whole. Our way is hidden from the Lord. The way they're talking about is the course of their life. Our hard and our difficult road is hidden from him. Not only that, but our justice is being passed over. We're suffering and the Lord is paying no regard to it. There's a sense of despair, sadness, hopelessness even in the complaint. We're troubled on every side and our situation is dire. And Lord, you don't even seem to see it. You don't even seem to care about how we're being treated. Now look, underlying the complaint is the reality and the confession that God is actually sovereign and all-powerful. They're crying out because he's their God and they know that he has the power to affect change in this situation. He has the power to right the wrong in their eyes. If they didn't believe that he was able, then it'd be a waste of time to cry out to him. What they're saying is our complaint, Lord, is that you can do it, but you haven't. And this leaves us in more despair. One thing we should realize is that complaint is actually a prominent occurrence in the Bible. You hear regularly in Psalms, places like Psalm 13, when the psalmist says, How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Psalm 27, the psalmist David says, Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. Cast me not off. Psalm 42, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 7 says to the Lord, Oh Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. You're stronger than I am and you've prevailed. I've become a laughingstock all the day. Everybody mocks me. Here is a regular feature of complaint when you find it in the scriptures. We are suffering or I am suffering in what I perceive or we perceive to be an unjust situation. And Lord, you don't seem to care. How are we going to survive in the middle of oppression, in the middle of injustice, if you are not for us? If you are not on our side, how are we going to make it? As one commentator put it in this Uh, in, In commenting on these questions, in verse 27, he says, the first question is theological, touching on the nature of God that he can't see. And the second question is experimental, touching on or relating to the experience of the people. My prayers don't seem to be answered. Let me ask you this question this morning. What do you do? What do you do in the face of ongoing oppression and injustice? How do you respond to the never-ending reality of suffering and sorrow in this life? Whether it is the racial injustice that still plagues this nation or the oppression that is encountered by the most vulnerable people in other parts of the world, passages like this give us the freedom to bring our complaint before God. We instinctively know that God is good and God is just, so it's actually better to bring our complaint to him instead of becoming despondent about the suffering or even ignoring it altogether. Because notice that it's the Lord who's asking the questions. Why do you keep saying that I can't see what's going on? Why do you keep saying that I don't care? 
the message from the Lord is don't only use your personal experience as the basis for understanding what I see, what I know, and how I act. His response to their complaint is to remind them of their confession. It comes to them in the form of two more questions in verse number 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? These are rhetorical questions the Lord is saying, you already know. You've already heard. You are, you are not a people without a history in the middle of the situation. Why are you acting as though you don't already know what I'm like? In the middle of the situation, when you're full of complaint because of the injustice, you need to remember what you already know about me, he's saying, and what you've already learned. You're not a people without a history. Uh, You know what I've done for Israel already is his point. So remember the confession. The Lord is the everlasting God. The Lord is the God of eternity. He has no beginning and he has no ending. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. Everything that exists, exists because he created and because he's eternal, he's not like you. His way can be hidden from me, but it is impossible for my way to be hidden from him. Our situation could never be hidden from him because he created everything and everyone. There's nothing he doesn't know. There's nothing he doesn't see. He is omni-everything, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, omni-just, and every other good thing. Not only that, he says, remember, he doesn't get tired or grow weary. He doesn't get tired or grow weary. The creation continues. The sun continues to shine and rise. The planets and the stars, they continue to follow the course in the heavens that he has set for them. He's not like us. He doesn't need sleep. He doesn't get exhausted. He's got no need to take a break from his work. He's not so tired from helping Joe out over here that he's got to take a break before he comes to help you out over here. That's not what God is like. His understanding, he says, is unsearchable. His understanding is unsearchable. You and I cannot comprehend what he knows. There's no limit to the depth and the breadth and the width and the height of what he understands. You and I cannot scratch the surface. This is God. This is what he's like. And listen, if you've come to God, if you've come to know God as we sang this morning through the only possible way, that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the reality of his sovereignty, the reality of his his power, it is a cause for rejoicing in thanks and praise. Even in the face of injustice and suffering and sorrow, we do not have to worry or fear that we serve some impotent God. We don't have to worry that we serve a God that has to consult somebody else before he goes to effect change. Just like the people of Israel who received this passage first were people with a history who knew what the Lord had done for them, Christians are people with a history. Christians are people with a personal history. To be a Christian means to be able to testify, to bear witness that God has brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light, is to be able to confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. But Christians are also people with a corporate history as well. We understand that the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ is the event that changed the world. It was God's declaration to the world that he was committed not just to changing individual lives, but to remaking the whole creation. Taking it back 
for himself. And what that means is that as Christians understand that justice delayed doesn't mean justice denied. So you and I need the eyes of faith to see that. You and I need the eyes of faith to see that. We need those same kind of eyes. Those are the eyes. Those are the kinds of eyes that cause a community of people to sing, walk together, children, don't you get weary. Those are the eyes that cause the community of people by faith to sing to each other, sing together, children, talk together, children, shout together, mourn together, don't get weary. See, they understood the comfort, third C, the comfort that comes from grasping the last part of the text. Verse 29, he gives power. He gives power to the faint. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. He gives strength to the weary and to those who are powerless, he increases power. This verse is like a parallel verse. Both halves of the verse say the same thing with increasing intensity. God is making this thing happen, right? The sufferings and the issues and the trials of life help us to realize that we are not in control. But he doesn't grow weary and he isn't lacking in any power. He has no need of rest. He's merciful and gracious and because of that, he will give strength to his weary children. Are you lacking in power this morning? He says he'll cause the might of his children to increase. A number of years ago, Gatorade had this commercial that they would run of these athletes, these professional athletes, basketball players, sprinters, tennis players, football players, and they're they're exerting themselves on the field of play and and perspiring and sweating. And and after a while, you notice that they're not sweating regular sweat. They're like sweating Gatorade, right? There's there's purple and red and, and orange and pink and blue coming from the pores. And then at the end of the commercial, right, the, 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 uh, the, the announcer asks the question, is it in you? right? How are you going to get through this? Is, do you got some Gatorade in you? Well, that's all right if you need to run down a football field, all right? But how are you going to endure through the pressures, the trials, the suffering, the injustices of this life? The question is, is he in you? Have you received from God by faith in Jesus Christ the gift of his spirit? That is the question. We need to ask this because it says he gives strength to the weary. This is how he does it. He gives power to the powerless. Notice something. It doesn't say that he gives strength to those who are already strong. It doesn't say he gives power to those who are already mighty. But it gives him, he gives it to those who are lacking, to those who are weary. And this is the comfort you know, I, I don't know if people say this anymore. When I was growing up, I used to hear this all the time. People say, you say, God helps those who help themselves. Like, that's a lie. That's not in the Bible. God, is, as a matter of fact, most particularly, God helps those who recognize they can't help themselves. When we recognize our need, when we recognize our powerlessness, God steps in by the power of his spirit. He steps in with comfort and peace. It is only those who feel and admit their weaknesses who can actually benefit from or receive or make use of this giving. The, the, the issues of life will be there for you and I until the Lord Jesus Christ returns to set every wrong right. 
we will live through the ups and the downs of life. We will have times where we sound like Job sounded in Job chapter 7 and verse 1 when he said, Has not a man a hard service on earth and all his days are like the days of a hired hand, like a slave who longs for the shadow and like a hired hand who looks for his wages? He said, So I am allotted months of emptiness and nights of misery are apportioned to me. He says in chapter 14 of his book, man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. Right? Job was a man well acquainted with grief and suffering and pain and struggle. He knew full well that, uh, and good that his strength wasn't adequate, but we, he was also well acquainted with the God who gives strength to the weary. He was well acquainted with a God who's able to give power to the weak. That's why in the middle of his desperate situation, he was still able to cry out, though he slay me, I will hope in him. This will be my salvation that the godless shall not come before him. We have a continual need to realize that our own strength is inadequate that our own strength is inadequate to deal with the problems of this life. That is a testimony that runs throughout the Bible. And so I, uh, I, the prophet says in verse 30, even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. They'll be tired and faint. Young men, he says, will will utterly stumble, even the strongest and most choice of the society when it comes to physical strength is the point, will grow weary and fall. Even those you would expect to be able to endure cannot escape from being worn out by this life. Youth and vigor are not enough. Nothing but the strength that God provides to his weary children is enough to enable you to endure. And what does it take? Verse 31 says, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In contrast to the youth and the young men, those who wait on the Lord, those who trust in his promises, those, those who lean on him for strength won't become tired. They won't faint. They're able to endure the difficult times with expectation that he will keep them in the middle of the suffering. He will keep them in the middle of the trials and the testing. Those who, who wait here that sense is awaiting with hope. It's not just a dreary and a dreadful kind of waiting around. You could also translate this as those who hope in the Lord will receive new strength, have the sense of, of getting a, a, an exchange, a replacement of strength. This is the promise, is that those who hope on the Lord keep on receiving new strength. It's not just the reviving of your old, tired, useless, inadequate strength. It is an exchange. God says he's going to throw away your useless strength and replace it with his. Remember, right, verse 28, he doesn't grow weary. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't faint. Uh, and the question is, do you need a strength exchange? God says he'll replace your strength with his. Listen, it's the only thing that will do. It's the only thing that'll do. Anything else is an imposter. Anything or anyone else that promises you this kind of strength is lying. Your money is not telling you the truth. Your possessions, your house, your cars, your institutions of higher learning, they cannot provide strength when we're weary. <laughs> They cannot provide the comfort from the storms of life. They're not able to do so because they're all creatures and creations just like us. They'll fail you. They'll wear out. You want the strength to endure all the trials of life? Right? The 
answer is running to Jesus. I love this quote that John Oswald gives about this reality. He says, God graciously makes his vitality available to the failing of the earth. But does the receiving depend on any particular condition, he asks? Only one, and it's specified here, waiting on the Lord. To wait on him is to admit that we have no other help, either in ourselves or in another, but by the same token, to wait on him is to declare our confidence that he will eventually act on our behalf. So waiting on the Lord is not merely killing time, but it is a life of confident expectation. They will stretch out their wings like eagles, he's right. The eagle's ascension into the sky seems effortless. The eagle is able to soar high above the earth without threat or concern that it will fall to the earth. For far from being crushed to the earth by their own helplessness, those who depend on God through Christ can stretch out their wings in the effortless way of eagles and sail off into the wind. Wrap it up this way with the words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, where he says, Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For those who belong to Jesus Christ, God has provided the avenue to his throne because the Christian is covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God will incline his ears to our cries and prayers even when it seems like he's silent. Understand, even when it seems like he can't see and he's not hearing. Understand, that because of Christ, God always hears and he always listens and he's always seeing and he's always acting. The answer to our cries for justice, the answers to our cries for relief, how they may not come (laughs) in the ways we are expecting. Why? Because our understanding is limited. He says there's no searching to the Lord's understanding. You can't find the depths of it. So he's always acting, but our understanding is limited while his is unsearchable. So what do we do? We do what the song says. Walk together, children. Don't you get weary. Sing together, children. Shout together, children. Talk together, children. And even mourn together, children. Don't you get weary. There's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the balm and the comfort for our souls. That you give us of your spirit that we would walk in this new life, that we would be strengthened by your resurrection power to endure the trials, the hardships, the sufferings, the injustices, to not turn a blind eye to those things, but to live in a hopeful expectation as we wait on you. Would you be pleased to strengthen us for this walk and uh, for this life by the power of your spirit. We ask it in your name. Amen.